There are two ways to handle disability well in any fictional medium, well, any sort of diversity really, but we're focusing in on disability. One way, the way we're not actually going to be talking about today, is directly facing it head on. You introduce some disabled character into a narrative in order to make that disability an issue so that you can use it as a jumping off point to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about, be it ableism, or the difficulties surrounding a certain disability, or certain medical issues, or accessibility, or what have you. The second way, and the way we are talking about today, I'll get back to that first one in my next disability video, but the way we're talking about today is normalization. Normalization, while equally as valuable, is essentially the opposite of attacking the issues head on. Rather, you introduce characters with disabilities and then essentially do nothing with it. Those disabilities are part of the characters, but they are not a driving force in the plot, a driving force in the character's motivations, or a main conceit that's used to propel the narrative. Rather, they are simply a part of those characters. They are normal, hence normalization. This is valuable because the more saturated the media becomes with characters with disabilities, the more we'll start seeing them as normal, which in turn can be valuable for breaking down discriminatory stereotypes in real life. But how do you normalize disability within anime? How do you portray disability in a way that makes its presence obvious but also does not make it the center conceit of the narrative. The best way is to include it in a narrative that already has a central conceit. Slice of Life series are not good for this. Rather, you want a story with a strong overarching plot or premise that has a strong enough momentum that it doesn't rely on individual character arcs to keep the story moving forward. In order to thoroughly explore disability normalization within anime, I thought it would be interesting to dive today into the best version of normalization I have ever found within science fiction when it comes to disability. Yes, today we are talking about Steins Gate. Now, when you first saw this video's title, Disability and Steins Gate, you probably had some raised eyebrows, and I'm not surprised because when you think of Steins Gate, you don't think of disability. You think of time travel, you think of psychological drama, you think of a whole lot of other things, but not disability, and that, of course, is the whole point of normalization that it is there and being, well, normalized without being the center of key point of the narrative. But Steins Gate, contrary to what people might think going in, is actually a hugely disability positive anime, specifically in the area of neurodivergence. In the original Steins Gate anime, fully half of the cast was disabled, and in Steins Gate Zero, we were introduced to two new main disabled characters. But before I start diving into who these characters are and how they're handled, I want to take a minute to address the term I'm using, neurodivergence. And as tempting as it is to simply define neurodiversity as the opposite of neurotypicality, I know that's not particularly helpful. So here I'm going to have a go at actually defining it. Neurodivergence is, well, exactly what it sounds like. If neuro is brain and diverge is different, then it's a different brain. It's people whose brains are wired differently. It's a term used to describe people whose disabilities cause them to have various neurological differences from what is accepted as the common norm. It's not an insulting term by any means. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with these differences. It just means that they exist. And that's the thing. Neurodivergence is just that. Different. Not bad. Not wrong. It can include anything and everything from dyslexia to autism to bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, hyperempathy syndrome, ADD, ADHD, and a hundred other things that I'm not going to get the chance to list off. But hopefully that should at least give you some idea of what it means when I say neurodiverse and talk about neurodiversity. Which is important because almost everything I'm going to talk about today falls under the category of neurodiversity. We'll get to you in a second, Maho. But for now, let's dive right into the original Steins Gate series. The characters who I'm referring to as disabled are Suzuha, Moeka, Mayuri, and of course, Okabe. Now I want to start with Okabe because I want to clear something up. A lot of people look at him and if they're going to think disabled, they think schizophrenia, bipolar, anything that would explain the Hoin Kyoma persona. The thing is, Hoin Kyoma is not a disability. It's imaginary. There is a world of difference and I can't stress that enough. Okabe is not having delusions or hallucinations or multiple personality or anything like that. He's making it up. As we learn throughout the series, Okabe created the Hoin Kyoma persona to help Mayuri get over the death of her grandmother. He began playing it up more and more as the time passed in order to help her cope, and it became second nature to him, becoming a habit that he put on even when she wasn't there. 
And the series is in no way ambiguous about this fact. Not only does it show us the origins of Hoenn Kyoma, but it also multiple times throughout the story has Okabe admitting to Kyoma's non-existence. No, Hoenn Kyoma is not a disability, and Okabe doesn't actually even start the series disabled. Okabe becomes disabled over the course of the series as the trauma of everything he goes through throughout Steins Gate lands him with PTSD. This is one place where I really have to commend not only the writing of the show, but also its direction, because Steins Gate uses its visuals in order to both fully express Okabe's PTSD and also clue the viewer in to how Okabe's feeling, aligning our mindsets with his. Throughout the series, we see the constant trauma of trying to save Mayuri, wear Okabe down, and land him with an inability to function. The trauma of the experience gets so bad that when the chance comes to save Kurosu at the end of the series, Okabe initially gives up, unable to face the constant re-looping of the trauma that he experienced with Mayuri. But where Steins Gate's portrayal of Okabe's PTSD really shines isn't actually in the original series, but rather in Steins Gate Zero and in the movie Loading Region of Deja Vu. While the movie may have been a rather lackluster sequel to the series, having some good points but also some more mediocre moments, one of the things that it handled best was PTSD. Specifically, it used time travel and the ability to slip between world lines as a metaphor for PTSD. Okabe is stranded between world lines. Despite the fact that he's now on the Steinsgate world line where everything is safe and happy, the memories of everything he went to keeps him moving to the R world line a world line where his trauma exists. He keeps quite literally slipping out of reality and back into trauma, a perfect metaphor and visual representation of the flashbacks suffered by many people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Furthermore, Steinsgate does a great job of handling this in a way that does not brush over PTSD as something that can be cured easily. See, that's a problem that anime often has. Typically, when a story wants to make use of PTSD, they have a character fight some sort of monster in the past, resulting in the death of that character's mentor, parent, sibling, whatever. Now the villain is back, and the main character has to fight that character all over again. Our character with supposed PTSD is traumatized by their last experience fighting this character, but then their friends say something, or do something, or put themselves in danger, or something, and it snaps this character out of it. They're able to push past whatever boundaries they had and defeat the villain, and then those mental hangups go away and never come back. This is not how PTSD works. Like, at all. PTSD doesn't just go. It's a neurological change. It's not something that can be flicked on and off with the switch. I'm not saying that talking has no value. It absolutely does. A person can definitely talk someone out of an episode or through an episode by helping them to reconnect with the world around them. In fact, that's exactly how Steins get handles it. In Loading Region of Deja Vu, Okabe has a flashback when he hears people coming up the steps of the lab. Immediately, his mind goes to the time when the people came up the steps of the lab and they were the rounders, led by Moeka, and they shot Mayuri. And the thing is that since we watched that scene over and over again, the same way he did, we also immediately jumped to that scene. We have aligned ourselves instantly with Okabe and with his tension and with the way that we think that this is going to go down. This puts us in the head of Okabe, who is the character with PTSD. Then it turns out that it's just Mr. Braun, but Okabe is too on edge, and he pulls a knife. Kurosu then has to talk him down, helping Okabe to come to terms with the reality he's actually standing in, that he's safe on the Science Gate world line, and that nobody's about to die. This helps Okabe get through this particular episode, but it's not the end of his PTSD. And that's honestly as it should be, because PTSD cannot be gotten rid of through a single conversation, and anime's tendency to make it seem that way is minimizing to the people who actually have to deal with it every day, and who can't just get snapped out of it like that. Speaking of the way that our associated memory reminds us exactly why Okabe is so traumatized by the sounds of footsteps on the lab stairs. This is a trick used, again and to great effect, in the first episode of Steins Gate Zero. The first episode of Zero really focuses on Okabe, his PTSD, and how it's changed him. Heck, our first reintroduction to him involves him having a trip to the therapist. And yes, we are seeing an anime where an anime character with PTSD is actually going to a therapist. Which is basically unheard of. And it's really cool to actually see this. 
Steinsgate manages to hit the right note with therapy. On one hand, it implies that yes, therapy can absolutely be helpful, but on the other hand, it does not go overboard and imply that therapy can fix all of everyone's problems. Not only is this the right balance to strike, it's actually a pretty hard one to hit, but Steinsgate nails it in just a few sentences and then moves on with the scene. We see Okabe boarding a train, and we are instantly thrown into the tension he feels, and this is all down to the direction. We focus in on the train coming around the corner. Now, in the past, we have seen the same train come around the same corner and kill Mayuri, and so has Okabe. The immediate tension he feels seeing this remembering that scene is exactly the same sort of tension the audience is feeling when the direction subtly reminds us of that scene, and so we end up in the same mental space as Okabe with the same level of tension, aligning ourselves with him and with his PTSD. This does a great job of getting us to understand exactly how Okabe is thinking and what effects his PTSD has had on his psyche. We get another glimpse of this a few minutes later when his phone rings on the train, and the shot focuses in on his phone just long enough to subtly remind us of the D-mail and the trauma associated with it. This is a tactic that the director also made use of back in the original Steins Gate anime, in the case of Suzuha. Suzuha also has PTSD from her future, all of her futures. This is something we're clued into completely through the visuals we are given. Specifically in her reaction to certain people and noises. Obviously, we see her reactions to courtesy, but there's also this really notable scene where there's a chopper going overhead, a news chopper for the fireworks later, but Suzuha reacts as though she's reacting to a bomb plane. The noise of the helicopter begins behind Suzuha, and the camera reacts by zooming in quickly on her startled and afraid face. We see her crouching down to avoid the copter, just as we get another zoom in on the copter itself, seeming as though it's descending. The quick camera movements, coupled with the obvious fear on Suzuha's face and her quick reactions, give us the clues we need to fill in the rest. This is a bomb plane. This is a dangerous. And then, of course, we zoom back out, seeing things from Okabe's normal perspective, seeing things as just normal. But for a moment there, we saw what Suzu was seeing, and we shared in her stress and tension. In direct contrast to the way in which Suzuha and Okabe are treated, we have Moaka. Where Suzuha and Okabe are examples of disability from the inside, that is, we are shown what it's like to be in their headspaces, Moaka's story is all about how other people interact with and in some cases take advantage of her disabilities. Moaka has severe, and I mean severe, depression and social anxiety. Her trick of hiding behind a phone screen isn't just some cute gimmick, it's her way of coping with the world around her as the show makes very, very obvious. And when we finally get up to her episode in the second half, our first shot is of her standing at the edge of a building. That visual is all we need to tell us everything we know about her. Her depression and social anxiety are incredibly bad, she has no one she feels like she can go to, and she was at the point where she was going to kill herself before the person known as FB stepped in. FB became the one person she could rely on and her reason to keep going, and then he manipulated and used that power he had over her in order to turn her into a criminal. Her story is all about the vulnerability left behind by depression and suicidal thoughts. Those suffering from depression and suicidal thoughts often rely on other people as reasons to keep living, and that can put them in a very delicate and vulnerable situation if these people are not people who are worthy of the trust placed in them. And that's kind of the whole key to Moika's character, since Moika herself is not intrinsically a bad person, but rather is someone who has become reliant on a bad person who is manipulating her. A fact further borne out by both the Beta World line of Steins Gate Zero and the Steins Gate World line, where we see Moika behaving in ways that are neither criminal nor particularly bad, but rather being actually supportive and helpful, as soon as she's put into an environment that's more positive, and given the sort of support she needs. The final disabled character from the original series is Mayuri. And Mayuri is an interesting one to talk about because while she's neurodivergent, I'm not going any farther than that. Her personality often comes off as very different down to a very fundamental level and the way in which she looks at the world is inherently different from the way in which other people approach things. And we also get a sense of her having hyperfixations or special interests, mainly upas. However, I'm not going to label her disability any farther than this for a few reasons. The main one being that there's no reason for me to even believe that the writers labeled her any farther than this. Until now, I've talked about characters who are all very obviously clearly portraying one or two specific paths of neurodivergence. However, Mayuri is not that black and white obvious, and therefore I have no reason to believe that the people who are writing the script for Steinsgate even had any idea what specific 
disability they wanted her to portray anything beyond the fact that she is not neurotypical. And so it's absolutely futile to try and diagnose someone who was never maybe meant to fit within a diagnosis. Of course, you could also say things like, don't want to be ableist by slapping her with a certain diagnosis, don't want to presume to diagnose when I'm not a medical physician, but at the end of the day, it all comes back to that one main thing, that I don't know that she was even supposed to portray anything beyond neurodiversity. Still, I think it's really important that we talk about Mary because she's a very interesting character. For one thing, she's the sort of character who most conventionally fits the sort of stereotypes that surround neurodivergence, the childlike personality and demeanor, the way she fixates on toys despite being an adult more or less, etc, etc. But there's also a lot more to Mayuri than all of that. Firstly, I'd like to take a look at one conversation between Okabe and Kurosu. It's the only conversation in which anyone even acknowledges that Mayuri is not what would be called normal. And that is basically all they say. See, Kurosu, irritated at Okabe, makes a comment about how she can't believe that Mayuri and Okabe were childhood friends when one grew up to be so normal and the other one grew up to be so not. And Okabe makes a comment about, yeah, well, Mayuri was always a little bit different. And Kurosu, rolling her eyes because Okabe's completely missed the point, quips back that no, she was talking about him. This is an important moment for a lot of reasons. Firstly, it establishes that yes, what we're seeing in the anime is what the characters are seeing. Now that's key because that says that it's not poor writing that has Mayuri acting a certain way, or it's not that she's trying to play to the audience. This is actually how this person is acting, and Okabe, Kurosu, and the other characters, as fully fleshed out people who live within the same social norms we do, sees her the same way we see her. The second is that I can't approve enough of Kurosu's attitude. That is to say that Kurosu honestly meant it when she said that Mayuri and not Okabe was the normal one. Her comment was genuine, and the point behind that is that Kurosu is the outsider. Where the other characters have had a long time to get to know Mayuri and realize that she's not just stereotypes and tropes, but an actual three-dimensional person, Kurosu hasn't. Yet from day one, Kurosu never infantilizes Mayuri. She never treats her as anything less than human. She never treats her any differently like she, than she'd treat anyone else. Now yes, Kurosu does simplify language when she talks to Mayuri, but not because she's infantilizing her, but because she's talking science and Mayuri isn't a scientist. It's the same way that Kurosu talks to Ruka, it's the same way she talks to Ferris, it's the same way she talks to anyone who isn't Daru and Okabe because Daru and Okabe understand the scientific terminology she's throwing around and the others don't. Okabe's comment is also important because even while he's quipping back at Kurosu, he's acknowledging Mayuri is different without actually saying that different is bad or that there's anything wrong with how Mayuri is or who Mayuri is. And his actions bear that out. Okabe never infantilizes Mayuri or talks down to her. None of the characters do, and none of the characters treat her like she should somehow be different or like she's deficient. Again, they treat her like she's normal, and that's exactly as it should be. Furthermore, Mayuri embodies several things that these sorts of characters typically don't. For one thing, Mayuri has a job. There are a whole lots of stereotypes that people who are neurodiverse are permanent children, they can't have jobs, they can't have responsibilities, etc, etc. Mayuri negates all of those. Mayuri has friends. She goes to school. She works a job. She takes care of Okabe. She has hobbies, like making cosplay and going to cons. She has a full, normal life. And that's the point. In Steins Gate Zero, she even adopts a child and is a really damn good mother. Not being neurotypical doesn't in any way impede her ability to do any of those things, and the show makes that very clear. And speaking of Steins Gate Zero, both of our main additions to the cast at that point, Maho and Kagari, are also disabled. Kagari's amnesia counts as a disability, but since it's entirely tied deep into the plot, it's not really something I'm going to talk about in the context of disability. Maho, however, is a really good example of someone with a disability, however she's the one character whose disability is physical rather than neurological. Maho has dwarfism, and yes, there's some jokes about her size and stuff like that, but that's not the concentration of her character and that's what I really like. Maho is a mature adult character. She's not portrayed as childish because of her height. She's portrayed as an adult woman with adult woman's problems and responsibilities. She has a huge story arc and none of it has anything to do with her size. Rather, it's all about her scientific abilities, her feelings of inadequacy when compared to Kurosu, the whole Sarietti Amadeus thing. It's about her problems as an adult and an intellectual. 
because the show treats her like an adult, and that's incredibly refreshing to see. And of course, Steins Gate includes all of this content, a lot, without ever once using the word disability. It simply handles these characters like their characters, having them go through their normal story arcs and their normal development, irrespective of the various disabilities, which are only one factor in their identities. The show does not trot out their disabilities as simple gimmicks, but rather treats disability and especially neurodiversity as an indelible part of these people. Not a joke, not a flaw, just a factor. And at the end of the day, that's really what normalization is all about. This is Coriander Stone, and I thank you for watching. L. Psy. Congrue.